Hello, New York. How you doing? All right. Some good energy. I'm excited. This is a hell of a panel. I'm excited. Uh, you know, we've got a lot to talk about, a lot to get to. Um, if, however, if at any point you decide this is not what you thought you came for, you aren't enjoying any of it, uh, we, I talked to them about this, we will refund your ticket price. <laughs> Completely. So excited to be here. Uh, to tell you a little bit how this is going to work is we're each going to do 10 minutes. I'm going to do my 10 minutes now uh, speaking to you about uh, various topics on propaganda, about propaganda, different aspects of it. And, uh, and then we're going to do uh, another half hour where I question the panel, and then we'll go to you guys. So have your questions ready for uh, that segment. I wanted to spend my little 10 minutes here on the language of propaganda, because a lot of propaganda is done in simply the way they, they couch things, the way it's talked about, the way they phrase things in our mainstream media. And like, you don't even notice, a lot of people don't even notice they're doing it. Like when they started bombing Syria, I remember, I was amazed at the number of times they said, and they're showing our missiles taking off, they kept saying, look at our advanced weaponry. Advanced weaponry, right? And they're having debates as to whether we should be doing it a little bit, but it's all couched in our advanced weaponry. That's not, uh, bombing innocent civilians is not advanced. It's barbaric, all right? It's barbaric. Like, calling that advanced weaponry would be like if you're uh, playing pool with someone, and, and you see two people playing pool, and then suddenly one of them person takes the pool cue and breaks it over the other guy's back. And you're like, that was pretty advanced. That was a pretty advanced move there. But this stuff is done endlessly in all of these conversations, especially around war, but around a lot that I'm going to get to. Uh, they, they also say 98% of our drones hit secondary targets. What's a secondary target? It's an innocent civilian. That's not a target at all, all right? It hasn't been targeted. But calling it a secondary target makes it sound okay, makes it sound justified. You know, if, if homeless people get money from our government, they call it welfare, they call it sucking off the state, right? But if the wealthy, if corporations get tax breaks, get money, get grants, then, then it's called a grant, right? It's called, it's called uh, tax breaks for job creators. It has a different terminology. If, if, uh, if, you know, our, our, our billionaires, let's be clear, our billionaires that run this society, they are not fucking philanthropists. Can we stop calling them philanthropists? They are sociopaths. <laughs> when you take that much, extract that much wealth out of the, the bottom 50% of the country, that is not philanthropy. They, three dudes, three guys own the same amount of wealth as the bottom 50% of our country. That, that, that's incredibly, it's insane and it's unstable. Our economy, you want to know how unstable our economy is? Just picture Chris Christie riding on the shoulders of Natalie Portman. That's our economy right there. We're, we're told to worship these people. They're on the cover of magazines. This is part of the propaganda. They're on the cover of our magazines like heroes. But if it were 50% of anything else other than money, if three people had 50% of the country's iPhones or Siamese cats or York peppermint patties, we would lose our minds. We'd be like, why, why do they get all the peppermint patties? I want some of that chocolatey minty goodness. But because it's money, we're supposed to worship them. You know, uh, when, when a protester breaks a, a window in a protest of a bank, it's called violence. Now, I'm fine with that being called violence, but I also think that when a bank forecloses on millions of homes, that is violence, all right? That is also violence. But that is never called violence in our media. Uh, you know, because to the homeowner, it's no different. Stealing their home and burning down their home is no different. It destroys their life uh, and, and people, 10,000 suicides connected to the last financial collapse. That is violence. And it's time we start talking about it that way. Uh, you notice when we don't support uh, a government being overthrown, then it's called a coup. But if we support it, then it's people fighting for freedom, right? <laughs> like in Bolivia right now, it's a freedom fight. 
You know, if, if, if you have a kid and you withhold medicine and food to the point that they die, you're called a murderer, right? But if our government does it, like in Venezuela, it's called economic sanctions. It's a different thing, right? A study has come out showing uh, we have killed 40,000 people in Venezuela due to our economic war, which is the way we should phrase it. It's economic war on people. So when people are dying, how is that, that, how is that not called a war? How is that not violence? Um, you know, and, and so something, a bit of a side note here. I, I'm amazed with the hatred. I mean, it's thanks to our propaganda, but the hatred towards Venezuela, the hatred towards governments like Cuba by certain people in our, a lot of our society, and it's kind of like, what, 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 even if you, let's, let's say you just despise socialism. Let's say you just hate it with a passion, like in your core, in your heart, you can't stand socialism. What does Cuba have to do with you? Let them live their lives however the hell they want to live them. I mean, being furious and wanting to hurt them, it, it, it'd be like if you just hated genital piercing so much that just knowing they're out there somewhere ruined your marriage. <laughs> it's totally insane. In our coverage on Venezuela, including the New York Times, including, you know, NPR, everything, the military, the Venezuelan military is often called troops loyal to Maduro. When was the last time the U.S. military was called troops loyal to Trump? But you don't even notice these things are being phrased that way. It sounds normal. It sounds okay. Oh, those are the troops loyal to Maduro. But what does that do? That gets us thinking, maybe they'll flip. Maybe a lot of them are not loyal to Maduro. So if they called the U.S. military troops loyal to Trump, there'd be a lot of people saying, our military shouldn't fucking be there because they're, why are they loyal to Trump? They shouldn't do that, right? But that's why they don't phrase it that way. That's why it's called the U.S. military. Sounds more cohesive, sounds together. We all support it. Also, I've noticed our media, maybe you notice this, whenever they're talking about Israel, say the, the people being shot uh, in the Great March Return, uh, unarmed people, children, 50% of Palestinians are under 18, so these are children being shot and killed. You notice they're often, uh, not often, almost entirely, when it is, rare moments it is covered, Almost entirely, it's covered in the passive voice. 25 Palestinians were killed. Oh, interesting. By what? By who? Who knows? I have an idea what they were killed by. Snipers shooting them. So that's how it should be phrased. You can have a debate as to whether it's justified or whatever. Have that debate. But it is Israeli snipers shooting and killing these people. And that's how it should be discussed. All right, I'm going to bring your incredible panel on here. You ready? Yeah. All right, I'm so excited about this. Our first panelist is an award-winning journalist and the author of several books, including best-selling Republican Gomorrah, Goliath, The 51-Day War, and The Management of Savagery. I always hate when someone's written more books than I've read. He is produced print articles for an array of publications, many video reports, and several documentaries, including Killing Gaza, and he founded The Gray Zone in 2015 to shine a journalistic light on America's state of perpetual war and its dangerous domestic repercussions. Please give it up for Max Blumenthal. Our next panelist is a writer and activist for peace and justice issues. She has been an editor and senior columnist for Black Agenda Report since its inception in 2006. She serves on the coordinating committee of the Black Alliance for Peace, the administrative committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition, and the advisory board of ExposeFacts.org. She is a contributor to the OR Books Anthology in defense of Julian Assange. Her first book, Prejudential, Black America and the Presidents, will be published by Steerforth, Steerforth Press on February 4th, 2020. Please give it up for Margaret Kimberly. And finally, our next panelist is the host of Pushback, a news show from the Gray Zone and a contributor to The Nation magazine. His coverage of Russiagate won a 2019 Izzy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Independent Media. He has previously worked as a host and producer at Democracy Now! and The Real News and as a producer at Al Jazeera English. His writings also regularly appear in Real Clear Investigations and Le Monde Diplomatique. Please give it up for Aaron Maté! 
I want to talk about uh, the, the issue of how propaganda manufactures consent. Uh, what I want to discuss briefly is uh, this topic in, in the context of how I think propaganda in the Trump era has enrolled liberals and progressives in something I think really dangerous for the world and also dangerous politically for uh, progressive politics in general and the prospects of stopping uh, right-wing politicians and right-wing power. <clears throat> uh, i begin with Russiagate. We all know now Russiagate was a scam and it was a political failure, but it happened for very deliberate reasons and I think it, it's, we need to reckon with those reasons. Uh, it arose, I think, because of a convergence of very powerful interests and all those interests had the same ultimate uh, interest which is protecting their own privilege and what the the beauty of their con is they got to enroll millions of people in it including liberals and progressives so Russiagate begins with the 2016 campaign already on the campaign trail you have national security state elites vo uh, voicing public opposition and concern about Donald Trump not because they care about his racism uh, or his misogyny, uh, but because they don't see him as a suitable steward of the U.S. empire. They also don't like the fact that he's deviating from certain orthodoxies, although the extent to which he means, uh, he, the extent to which he's sincere about that is, uh, is in question. But he's talking about having better relations with Russia, and he's also voicing rhetorical opposition to military intervention abroad. So he's uh, challenging the uh, consensus of the bipartisan foreign policy establishment, perhaps doing it as a con, because he's a good salesman, and I think it was a con. But nonetheless, he's doing it. So we see the hostility to Trump already arise then. Meanwhile, what's going on behind the scenes, we learn later on, is an actual investigation of a potential Trump-Russia conspiracy based on totally specious grounds that we don't have to go into now, but the results show just how baseless it was. The Mueller report couldn't even find a single member of the Trump campaign interacting with anybody actually acting on the Russian government's behalf. Only people who claim to know Russians or who might have a Russian passport. Um, meanwhile, you have the, the, the Clinton campaign and uh, you know, even before the election, they were latching onto this talking point that they had developed uh, as, of Trump as a Putin puppet. And after they lose the election in the surprise, shocking loss, uh, they have a meeting, as is reported in the book, Shattered, uh, within 24 hours of Hillary Clinton's concession speech, and they decide that this election was not on the up and up, and that one of the, one of the main reasons they lost was James Comey, the FBI director who came out with an October surprise, but also Russia. And they decide very deliberately to push that narrative above all else. And from that point, we have a nonstop uh, effort blaming Russia and blaming stolen emails for the loss of the Clinton campaign. Zero self-reflection uh, uh, on the part of the Clintons and their people for why they actually lost. And there's a very good reason for that, because honest self-reflection would mean uh, looking critically at your own policies. And given the fact that so many people were duped into believing that Trump was a working class champion who was going to take on the neoliberal establishment, for Democrats to transform and to actually offer a real alternative to Trump and show people why that was a con, that would mean uh, challenging their own privileged role within that system and basically giving up their role as the beneficiaries of the corrupt system that Trump fooled people into thinking he was opposing. Uh, and then we have the media, <laughs> thank you. and then we have, and then we have the media latching onto this because a you know catering to the national security state and the establishment wing is you know, generally the function of the elite media, which wants to uh, sell advertisements to privileged sectors and wants to reach elite audiences and sell them a worldview that reinforces their own privilege. And also this whole thing is great for ratings. They have a nonstop spy thriller. Well, what is the impact on everybody else? Well, the population, after some initial flare-ups of authentic resistance, remember the all of us going to the airports to oppose the Muslim ban, and uh, you know the, the excitement of an actual resistance in the early days of the Trump uh, of the Trump era. Well, all that gets kicked to the curb, and the general population is reduced to being spectators 
in an inter-elite battle uh, where now all of a sudden intelligence officials are our heroes and Trump is to be opposed not because of anything he's doing to the general population, not because of his uh, record tax heist, uh, the, the largest uh, upward transfer of wealth in U.S. history with his tax cut, cuts, but because he's not saying mean things about Vladimir Putin. And in public, he's, he's, he's appearing nice to Vladimir Putin. And what does this lead to? Well, so, you know, the, Trump's resistance, so-called resistance, is reduced to being led by unhinged conspiracy theorists positing that Trump is a Russian agent. Uh, and uh, all this hands Trump a massive gift and that instead of actually opposing him, people are clinging on to these crazy theories. Another gift comes when all this finally collapses, culminating in Robert Mueller, our savior figure, delivering testimony uh, in July and not even being familiar with the details of his own investigation, the one that was supposed to bring down Donald Trump. Now, one day later, Ukraine gate begins and it's pretty much a similar thing, a lot of parallels. There's the, the one difference is that this time it looks like Trump actually did something. There does appear to be some kind of scheme that he was overseeing to pressure Ukraine, although from the available evidence, I don't think it got very far, but we'll see. Maybe something will come up. But the parallels to Russiagate are enough, I think, to give pause and to uh, be seriously concerned. Again, the source of the worry originates with the national security state. And what are they upset about? You know, when Trump froze aid to Palestinian refugees, to UNRWA, in a deliberate bid, it, this was openly expressed, to uh, basically pressure Palestinian negotiators to give up their internationally recognized right of return. So straight up blackmail. Or when Trump uh, freezes aid to Central American migrants, and in fact uses that aid to pay the salaries of the coup plotters who he's trying to install in Venezuela. These national security state officials don't say anything, but what did he do here? He froze briefly some uh, aid or, or some, some money that was used to buy U.S. weapons to give to Ukraine to continue a proxy war uh, that the U.S. basically started back in 2014. That's what the issue is here. And uh, in the process, he also made some, he also uh, sought some investigations that could have implicated Joe Biden, who also happens to be another member of the of the elite, in the same way that the the uh, the, the the damage of Russiagate or the uh, or the the main offense that Trump was was supposedly committed was that he conspired in an effort to weaken another member of the elite, Hillary Clinton, which of course he didn't. But in this case, again, Trump was after Joe Biden, and you can't do that. You can bomb Cambodia like Nixon did. You can uh, kill and spy on activists like Nixon did. That's not impeachable, but going after another faction of the elite, that is. And so right now we're once again being enrolled in another national security state uh, generated quote unquote scandal with the promise again that that is going to bring down Trump. And the fantasy of this being, you know, the, end, the beginning of the end is once again very much prevalent. And the, um, that's the danger for domestic politics to the world. Uh, the, the, the fact that the underlying policy is not even scrutinized, so why are we arming Ukraine? Why are we fueling this proxy war? And why are we incentivizing Trump to increase tensions with, with nuclear-armed Russia? That is not being discussed. And uh, that is one area where the dangers here uh, are catastrophic, not just for progressive political fortunes, but for the entire world. And uh, I'll leave it there, and I'll pick up more on the question period. Thank you very much. Thank you. Margaret? Um, it's funny thing, when I was trying to figure out what to talk about, uh, about propaganda, it's like, well, what propaganda do I talk about? This, there's so, so much material there. Um, and just a few examples, Ukraine Gate now is, is uh, in the news. And there have been thousands of words written, uh, many hours of programming. But do they ever tell you that the United States overthrew the elected president of Ukraine, uh, and that when the US and other NATO nations deposed him, they put people in office, some of whom were just out and out Nazi sympathizers. You don't see any mention, you hear about Venezuela a lot. Maduro has to talk to the opposition. Well, he did. And when he did, and when he and opposition forces were on the verge of 
together jointly asking for an end to sanctions. The U.S. government dropped the hammer, told the opposition not to talk to him anymore, and said Guaido is president. Syria, President Assad, gassed his own people, we're told, over and over again. But now there are two whistleblowers from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons who dissent from the official findings and, findings and publicly state they were rigged. So where to begin? There's so much. So I decided to stick with a, a domestic issue. And when you write and speak, it's like, well, what moves you? What moves me the most? And my, I had my own personal meltdown a few months ago um, when this phrase appeared, Moscow Mitch, <laughs> in uh, reference to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. And it all started when he opposed efforts to uh, um, impose uh, verified voting, paper ballots, and so forth. And um, of course, uh, there's more propaganda telling us that the Russian government they didn't just collude, they hacked our voting system. And thus, this moniker Mon Moscow Mitch was born. Now, he does not want verifiable voting, that's true. But the reasons have nothing to do with Russia. The Republican Party lives and dies by its ability to steal votes, mostly from black people. There's voter suppression through felon disenfranchisement and voter ID laws. There's also actual theft and the changing of votes with these uh, mechanical systems. And the victims of these practices are mostly black people, but the news didn't mention this, and neither did most black people, sadly. Uh, vote theft, or rather the cover-up of vote theft, is among the most prevalent uh, points of propaganda in the country. And McConnell ought to be exposed, but for the reasons, for the right reasons. Um, we've seen two presidential elections since 2000 where uh, the outcome was determined by this. Bush did it in 2000, his, his brother disenfranchised black Flor Floridians. Hillary Clinton, we're told, lost the Electoral College by only 78,000 votes. But there were thousands of uncounted votes in places like Detroit. Um, and lies by the corporate media and their collusion with the Democratic Party ensures that this is going to go on. And by the way, Democrats don't say anything about this either. But uh, I have a special kind of anger for the people who uh, we at the Black Agenda Report call the black misleadership class. They know the deal. They know why Mitch McConnell wants to steal votes, but they don't say anything because they're captives of the Democratic Party. Some fear biting the hand that feeds them. Some are cynics. Some may be true believers, but the end result is that this injustice goes on. Um, so. Along comes 2016. A racist failed real estate developer, and Trump is that, succeeded, the only, only thing he succeeded at was promoting himself through the media. And he defeated Hillary Clinton, who was a terrible politician, who had her own integrity issues. And that allowed him to squeak through in the Electoral College, along with a vote, thref, vote theft. But neither she nor the Democrats say anything about the Electoral College. She's still hanging around. She's got something to say. Has she once said anything about the Electoral College? So the Democrats, they claim to be the inclusive party, the progressive party. But they're nothing of the sort. The differences between the two parties are small and getting smaller. And all they can say is that they're outwardly less racist than Republicans. After um, starting with Bill Clinton, when they decided to become the corporate as a corporate back party as much as the Republicans, what did we get? Bill Clinton, media consolidation, welfare reform, reform that put millions of people into poverty, uh, bombing Serbia, pushing NATO expansion. Barack Obama bailed out the banks with trillions of dollars, destroyed Libya, tried to destroy Syria and never said anything about the black people who loved him unless his goal was to scold and dismiss them. And he's still doing that now, even though he's not president. Yeah. So Trump was anathema to black people for very obvious reasons. Instinctively, we knew someone talking about make America great again wasn't talking about us. But he won and solidified black people's allegiance to this party um, that does nothing, including not win elections. 
And that's why, why otherwise smart people will talk about Moscow Mitch or collusion or some other such thing. And I think it's Re Russiagate, um, I think it resonates because it's comforting to people. Um, it's hard to admit that uh, the Democrats are as bad as they are, that Hillary Clinton was as bad as she was, and it's easier to believe that some guy in a foreign country who you've been told is evil millions of times uh, uh, actually changed the results of a, an election and not the party you cling to that raised a billion dollars and still couldn't get 78,000 more votes. But the cure for all this propaganda is to tell the truth. And who's going to tell it? The duopoly in this country, the political duopoly, is composed of a far-right party and a center-right party. I don't even know if the Democrats are center-right anymore. But they, uh, speaking of collusion, they collude with the corporate media and they dole out information as our misinformation uh, that benefits their crooked arrangement. So black people have gone from being the most savvy, most politically minded group in the country, the most left-leaning traditionally, and now live in hope that the same intelligence agencies that destroyed our liberation movement are suddenly going to save us, save us from Trump. So we have so many lies going on here, and propaganda is nothing but systematized lying. Um, that ramped up into high gear when uh, the system wanted to make uh, people who made demands go away. And that means history has to be disappeared, people have to be disappeared. And I'm glad I'm old enough to remember uh, a few days ago was the 50th anniversary of uh, enormous marches in Washington and around the country against the Vietnam War. It's estimated two million people. There are two marches, one in October, one in November of 1969. And if I didn't remember it myself, I might not know that it happened. So we're propagandized to believe that that never happened, which means you can't do it again, which means you have to rely on the electoral system. All you can do is vote. That's all you can do is vote. And you have to vote for the Democrats, and you can't ask them anything, you can't demand anything, because then you'll get Trump. But people in the rest of the world are in movement, in Haiti, in Ecuador, in Bolivia. And many of us say, why doesn't that happen here? Because we propagandize more. So, uh, so here we are with Ukraine gate starting, and um, the media, and the, it's disgusting to watch these. I, I don't know if you, I, I can't stomach it for very long, these, uh, Democrats fawning over some guy because he's in a uniform, but anyway. <laughs> so here we have a situation where people who are triggered by Trump are unable to think for themselves and never follow the logical path of naming and shaming the people whose corruption and its resulting ineptitude put him in office. I'm a... Uh, I was surprised to see after 2016 how so few people expressed any anger towards Hillary Clinton or the Democrats. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The master of propaganda was Barack Obama, and um, he's been proving that again with his words of late, but it's having less resonance, I believe. And we all remember hope and change. But if you were paying attention, you knew it was BS even then. Now he's running all over the world when he isn't giving speeches, getting paid half a million dollars, tell, wagging his finger and telling us, you can't ask for anything. You can't have anything you want. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to close now. I'm running out of time. It always takes more time uh, uh, than I think. So here we are, stuck with um, people who are on the losing side. But um, not only do people think the Democrats are their only political choice, but this party they cling to can't even deliver on its claim of electability. That's all we hear, electability, electability. They lost 1,000 seats while Obama was president in Congress, in state legislatures. All they had left was a presidency, and they messed up, and they lost that too. But people, most people won't say so. Um, and if you, there's a couple things. I, I know I'm over time a little bit. But um, you know, you can tell you're being propagandized if you're told one month, James Comey is evil, it's his fault Trump is president. And then a few months later, Comey, hooray, he's gonna save us. 
Jeff Sessions, when he appointed him attorney general, people were like, oh my God, so terrible, old segregationist. Then there was some Russiagate nonsense and he could be fired and people literally protested to protect <laughs> Jeff Sessions. <laughs> they, <laughs> well, at least we know people were capable of still going uh, of protesting. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up. <laughs> but that's all because of propaganda. And it's nothing but lies being told endlessly by powerful people and institutions. Thank you all very much. Uh, Max? I, I, I want to kind of pick up where Margaret left off. Because um, she was talking about you know, the Vietnam War, the era of liberation movements, which were attacked by COINTELPRO, by a information war managed by the FBI, destabilization campaign. I remember a time not too long ago in a galaxy not far away when hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers marched in the streets against a war. Do you all remember that? Yeah. What the hell happened? I mean, it's good to see so many people out here, but the wars never stopped. Uh, and the route, but the rallies against them, they kind of dwindled out. Notice that it's just like us and our friends. Like, hey, what's up? How you been? I haven't seen you. <laughs> Two minutes. You're looking well. And and the most shocking thing is that some of our major progressive media institutions have actually become platforms for promoting these wars. And I'm not going to name any names. We all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Many self-identified progressives, as Aaron has demonstrated again and again, have become captives to the partisan theater scripted by the bureaucratic architecture of the national security state that has on its record the destabilization of large swaths of the globe. And so while Chileans and Haitians and Ecuadorians and indigenous and leftist Bolivians are an open revolt against austerity policies and right-wing governments imposed on them from within and without. So many self-styled progressives have been reduced to spectators, captivated by wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Russiagate and Ukraine Gate on corporate networks that function as a de facto retirement community for disgruntled spooks. <laughs> What's going on here is that the managers of savagery, the managers of our national security state, these soft-handed super predators, seem to have learned the lessons of Iraq, which is that even the most advanced conventional army on earth can be ground down by a few committed fedayeen. And that middle-class Americans will take to the streets when the coffins of their boys come home. And so the national security state has turned to hybrid warfare a sophisticated three-tiered method of war making that contains little risk of domestic political re repercussions. Though as I illustrated in my book, The Management of Savagery, it's absolutely guaranteed to generate blowback in the form of, for example, mass civilian casualty events like the Manchester bombing carried out by a UK proxy fighter who helped destroy the Libyan government and went to and from Libya on the MI6 rat line or through the rise of right-wing nationalist forces from Western Europe to Washington, who have successfully exploited the fear and loathing of desperate refugees created by NATO's regime change wars. The first dimension of hybrid warfare should be the most familiar, non-conventional war, or arming the rebels, the moderate rebels, as we've seen in Syria, in Libya, and as we see in Ukraine, where arms are even flowing into the hands of the neo-Nazi as of battalion, despite the best efforts of members of Congress like John Conyers, who's no longer there. And before that, we know about the arming of the, the Contras in Central America. Uh, for some reason, Democrats were willing to speak out against that at that time. Different era. When the government the rebels are facing begins to kill and imprison them in ham-handed fashion in order to preserve the state that is under attack by the most powerful empire in history, that government becomes the target of 800-page Human Rights Watch reports and then faces the second weapon in hybrid warfare, which is sanctions or unilateral coercive measures aimed to destroy their economies and pulverize their civilian populations. We just, uh, I just witnessed a really disturbing interview with Elizabeth Warren, 
uh, on Pod Save America, this podcast of these kind of like yuppie democratic apparatchiks. And this guy, I think it's like Tommy Vitor is saying, you know, Trump has a, had such a great policy in Venezuela. It was a brilliant diplomatic move. And, you know, not just recognizing Juan Guaido, um, who's like the, the Pete Buttigieg of Latin America. But, <laughs> but, but in preventing Venezuela from having an economy, he said, preventing Venezuela from having an economy. And Elizabeth Warren comes up, she says, you know, so, you know how she always leads in, goes, so. And I'm thinking she's gonna say something rational. And she said, I'm all for the sanctions. I'm all for that. I'm all for recognizing Juan Guaido. And she's just all in. I mean, I guess this is what Hillary Clinton meant by saying she was gonna run again, is it? <laughs> and so, you know, big structural change Bailey <laughs> rolled over for IMF structural readjustment policy Bailey. <laughs> this is the insidiousness, again, of hybrid warfare, where you have a self-styled progressive advancing economic terrorism against civilian populations from Venezuela to Iran to Syria, where people went without heating oil last winter. The final and most insidious aspect of hybrid warfare, which we're pretty much talking about tonight, is information warfare. This modality weaponizes the media and civil society to generate consent among the public for what impeachment celebrity and previously unknown um, national security apparatchik Alexander Vindman called the interagency consensus of foreign policy which the president is apparently forbidden from opposing, even if he or she was elected to do so. You know, the intelligence community, which is neither communal nor intelligent, has the final say on foreign policy. And whatever, whoever we vote for, doesn't matter. And what does he mean by the consensus of foreign policy? He means regime change, empire. So in order to manufacture consent for the imperial foreign policy consensus, our national security state establishes propaganda constructs to invent reality. These entities are often funded by CIA spin-offs like USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy, which was created to do what its co-founder, Alan Weinstein, said the CIA used to do covertly, but this time overtly in the open. The NED is the engine of violent right-wing opposition movements from Nicaragua to Venezuela to Bolivia, where the US-backed coup leader, Luis Fernando Camacho and his sig heiling paramilitaries have terrorized indigenous people for years. Behold the fruits of democracy promotion. I, was, I have two minutes and I was going to talk a little about the most notable and uh, award-winning propaganda construct known as the Syrian White Helmets, which were established not in Syria, but in Turkey by a former military intelligence officer named James Lemersurier handed over $100 million by the British Foreign Office and USAID, given HD cameras to enter areas controlled by the local affiliate of Al-Qaeda and its allies, areas where Western journalists were forbidden from entering for fear of literally losing their heads, and they were at the forefront of every major red line event alleging chemical weapons use and successfully helping to trigger US military interventions which prolonged the war and prolonged the death of so many Syrians and who now face unprecedented scrutiny thanks to the appearance of the two previously mentioned whistleblowers in the OPCW who alleged that the Duma chemical weapons attack was in fact not a chemical weapons attack and a pro-war fabrication. We relied to, again, the mysterious death of Le Mercurier, who has been branded a hero by the New York Times and a white savior by the Washington Post who according to what the Washington Post Middle East correspondent saved more people than anyone in Syria, has been predictably swept under the rug, more so than Jeffrey Epstein's death. <laughs> the few isolated critics of this propaganda construct who are like, could fit in this room and probably are in this room, <laughs> uh, and of you know, regime change operations in Latin America, of domestic political deceptions like Russiagate have been blacklisted, labeled Assadists, Russian and Venezuelan assets, and suppressed on social media while Pod Save America is pushed to the top of your YouTube feed. 
national security state marionettes like Jake Tapper win awards and plaudits for pushing the consensus line, while the most important journalist and publisher of our time, Julian Assange, languishes in a cell, threatened with extradition to a country he's not a citizen of, and threatened with torture. Threatened with torture. I th I'm about to stop. I thought about Assange a lot in my own prison cell where I spent two days on a false charge fabricated by members of a US-backed Venezuelan opposition. And I thought about what we could do to support him. And one thing we can do is to continue to use WikiLeaks as a treasure trove of information, of proven facts exposing the sadism of the managers of savagery in our national security state and to inform the public about what empire truly does and what it means for people on the other side of the gun. And at the gray zone, we've been going to the ground and breaking the media blockade in countries that are targeted for regime change simply for their desire to be independent and sovereign and in some cases, socialist. We are going to say the unsaid and the unsayable because so much of propaganda is rendering us silent and rendering the public ignorant. We are going to put out the fires that these arsonists keep lighting across the globe. And uh, we, and, and, and finally, I just you know, thank all of you for all the support you've shown me in these past weeks. Um, and you know, we'll be talking more about that throughout the night. Thank you. And by the way, let's, uh, I mean, I think most of you know this, but WikiLeaks has never published something false. Never. Compare that to every other mainstream media outlet that can't go 30 seconds without their head up their ass. I mean, Chuck Todd did half of the last episode facing the wrong direction, all right? So let's get, let's get to some questions. Margaret, I want to start with you. Uh, part of successful propaganda is erasing anything that stands up to the propaganda, that calls it out. Can you talk about the suppression, censorship, and attacks the Black Agenda Report has gotten over the years and how you deal with it? And maybe grab that mic. Okay, thank you. Well, we were uh, a few years ago, um, I was right after the 2016 election, this uh, mysterious list appeared on the Washington Post, which means it wasn't that mysterious at all. Uh, <laughs> Bezos's paper. Um, it's called Propaganda or Not, Prop or Not. And it was a list of sites and individuals who were said to be under uh, Russian influence. And Black Agenda Report was among them. And uh, we were very proud of that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we have the right enemies. Um, so things like that are um, our efforts to silence. There's supposed to be like some, you know, hall of shame or something like that, but uh, I think it told uh, discerning people who was telling the truth and who wasn't. Uh, so we get, we get those, we get those attacks. Our, our, actually, our worst attacks were when Obama was president. As mm -hmm. Obama critics, that's when we caught a, a lot of, of heat. Um, but we've experienced, and after that, we experienced what many other websites experienced, a loss of traffic. I would go on Google looking for articles that I knew I had written with my name, with Black Agenda for, and couldn't find them. No. Um, uh, so we are um, under attack. And these platforms, which held so much promise, because it was an opportunity you could get your, your voice out, you weren't depending on someone else. Well, they certainly clamped down on that. And uh, now we have, and to follow up on what I was saying, we have people calling themselves progressives saying that Facebook should be a fact checker. That is the last thing in the world that we should want. Getting advice from the Atlantic Council, we don't want them checking facts. They need to have transparency and they need to stop, for example, letting the Israeli government tell them which Palestinians can have uh, a page on Facebook or not. So those are the kinds of things we experience. And then again, sometimes it's just, it seems very passive. You're just not asked. It's, uh, um, you can write good stuff. You can uh, have good writers. But if you're saying the, the wrong thing, if you're giving the wrong answers, uh, then uh, you don't get the visibility. You don't get the invitations. 
Uh, but that's okay. We, we end up on proper knot, so that makes up for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, she, she's absolutely right about uh, search engines. By the way, everybody should do their best, and I realize it's hard to switch away from Google for a lot of your searches. Uh, if you do a search on Google, as she's saying with her articles, uh, but you do a similar search on DuckDuckGo, for example, you will find a completely different result page because Google has ranked down anything that doesn't fit into the, you know, the mainstream narrative. And uh, I, I've been, Redacted Tonight has been incredibly suppressed. Uh, YouTube's not showing our videos to people anymore. They unsubscribe people. Uh, on Facebook, my Facebook page, which is very, was very large and was gaining tons of people, has uh, been capped for the past two years, shadow capped, can't gain people on Facebook. They're not showing to people. So it is uh, an endless amount of suppression. I don't know if anyone else wants in on this. Max? Well, I, I actually called uh, Twitter in 2017 to ask them about some of this suppression, and uh, I was given, I was uh, handed over to their spokesperson, who was the former spokesperson for Barack Obama's National Security Council. <laughs> uh, the head of Twitter's Middle East uh, Bureau is a officer, a reserve officer in, Brit in the United Kingdom uh, 77th Brigade, which is the public information office of its military. In other, in other words, the propaganda arm of the British military and the British Foreign Office. So that tells you a lot about what Silicon Valley is doing with these social media platforms. They've become honeycombed with national security state operatives in order to enforce a certain perspective and to suppress another one. Right, and so, uh, you know, we rely on people like you to uh, share this stuff and get it out even when we are uh, incredibly suppressed. Um, Aaron, I wanted to ask you, you've, you've, you've been in the news business for a long time. You've interviewed a lot of amazing people at different outlets. There's a constant fight in media for access to certain types of guests. Can you talk about what access means and how it, it you know, pushes so many networks and journalists towards a propagandistic reporting? Well, just look at the staffing of the two major liberal networks now. So, you know, the biggest scandal for the Trump's term has been Russia Gate. Now it's Ukraine Gate. But the, you know, there's a lot of parallels as, as we talked about. And look at who some of their top analysts are. So, on MSNBC, you have a senior national security analyst named John Brennan, the former director of the CIA, who also played, I think, a critical, if not the critical, role in generating Russia Gate to begin with. Uh, one of his uh, new uh, fellow M MSNBC analysts is uh, Andrew Weissman, who, as I think the Mueller hearing revealed, when again Mueller did not know the basic details of his own probe, I think that underscored <laughs> that Andrew Weissman, uh, who was on Mueller's team, was the real head of that probe. So, um, and then over on CNN, you have uh, former director of national intelligence James Clapper. You have Andrew McCabe. You have Jim Baker, all key officials who served in the intelligence community under Obama and played a role in Russia Gate. So literally now, when you have the two major networks covering, you know, the biggest story of Trump's presidency, they're literally covering their employees, you know, and that dynamic, unfortunately, it, you know, it's it's not even a matter of uh, professional alliances in that way. It's just because media networks have, uh, especially in the Trump era deemed intelligence officials to be uh, their saviors, uh, the scrutiny on their behavior is pretty much absent and it's relegated either to you know, outlets like the Gray Zone or it's on you know pro-Trump sites that don't like these people because he's going after their hero and everyone else is just sort of worshiping them and taking their actions and their words on faith. And of course this isn't just unique to tr the Trump era, we saw it during the Iraq war and we've seen it forever. but. I think one distinction we can draw with the Trump era, as Max has talked about a lot too, is that it's enrolled liberals and progressives in thinking that all this is great. <laughs> all of it, yeah. <clears throat> all of it's great, in it? And the, the, the uh, intelligence community is our heroes yet again. So it's good we got back to that. Um, Max, I wanted to ask you about one of the most important forms of propaganda is just lying by way of omission, just leaving it out. Uh, you know, a, a, an example of like 
what the, the genocide Saudi Arabia has created in Yemen was not talked about for several years. I mean, starting under Obama, there was a whole, I think uh, FAIR did a study or someone did a study and MSNBC didn't mention Yemen for an entire year. I think it was 2016 or something. And, and anyway, I wanted to ask you about the, the propaganda of ignoring stories. And, and a, a good example is recently uh, your arrest, which you'd think your colleagues, fellow journalists, might be concerned if uh, you know, DC police come to a fellow journalist's house, arrest him for false charges from five months ago without warning. You, that might bother them, and they might mention it. Uh, but it was kind of not talked about. Uh, speaking of ignoring stories, I heard there's a front-runner candidate named Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> Not hearing too much about that. It's like the Buddha judge surge. He is pulled into fourth place. He's surging. L literally, New York Times did a cover story about how he got 700 people to show up. Bernie gets 700 people when he takes a shit in the bathroom. Like it's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there are so many layers to, you know, ignoring and omission. Um, I read in the New York Times that Abel Morales is deepening the divide by accusing his opponents of being racist and anti-indigenous and even of overseeing a coup. So it's kind of like, let's put all that into question. Was it a military? Well, that's what Abel Morales says. So if you look at any Reuters dispatch on Venezuela, uh, you know, there'll be, uh, uh, an article on Jack Ryan, this new uh, regime change propaganda show, action show, which is like to, you know Tom Clancy, Cold War kitsch repurposed for millennials on Amazon Prime, uh, <laughs> pushing you know the, the, just a ridiculous narrative about Venezuela, and you know the critics. The, so, so Reuters will write about it, and they'll say. Nicolas Maduro, the increasingly authoritarian leader, says that Jack Ryan is bad. They won't interview some academic or present the other side. They always go to the leader. Same with Syria. Um, you know, Bashar al-Assad denies that he killed seven million puppies. You know, <laughs> something like that. And then speaking of Syria, to be a little more serious, I mean, this is where we've seen, I think, one of the most sophisticated and expensive propaganda um, d d uh, tidal waves. It may be more sophisticated than Iraq because, as I said, it employs the kind of uh, modalities of uh, hybrid warfare and, you know, Americans don't even, many, most Americans don't even know the U.S., didn't even know the U.S. was involved until Trump abandoned the Kurds. Um, and so here's two things that have gone unmentioned. The first is that, um, you know, you saw this freak out uh, starting emanating from Washington, spreading throughout the country, um, using the kind of partisan divide against Trump to mobilize Democrats about the supposed abandonment of the Kurds where Trump was um, redeploying something like 400 U.S. soldiers from the al Hasaka province, which is heavily Kurdish in northern Syria, to, um, to uh, Syria's oil wells to basically protect their oil from ISIS. In other words, to steal their oil. Um, and this was part of a deal in which the Turkish government, Erdogan, would get to create a so-called buffer zone in which he will basically begin to ethnically cleanse uh, Kurdish regions and the uh, pre-existing population and then repopulate it with Syrian refugees who've been living in Turkey. And in order to wage that assault on the Kurdish YPG, renamed the Syrian Democratic Forces by a US general, to go after a US proxy Erdogan repurposed the old U.S. proxies among the moderate rebels. In other words, the groups that the CIA and the Pentagon armed, 21 of the 28 groups comprising the so-called Turkish Free Syrian Army, participated in this heinous and bloody invasion of northern Syria, and everyone was freaking out in Washington about it, but these same groups previously comprised the Free Syrian Army that the CIA itself set up, that John McCain went and visited and said, you know, I'll see you in Damascus, um, we'll go lynch those Alawites together, you know. And so Samantha Power, this is like the ultimate compartmentalization, denounced the brutality of the Turkish Free Syrian Army. But Samantha Power in the Obama administration said that these people, in, in an Atlantic article, this was reported by former Israeli prison guard Jeffrey Goldberg, who's the executive editor of The Atlantic, um, that Samantha Power is painting them as carpenters and ordinary workers who are just like the American Minutemen. 
Um, and we've seen them denounced as brutal pirates and terrorists, but these are the same people doing the same things they did to Syrians all along. This has been completely left out of coverage of what's happening in northern Syria. They're basically being set, uh, attacked and condemned because they're attacking, a former U.S. proxy is attacking a current U.S. proxy. And uh, in terms of leaving stuff out, I know we, we focused a lot on foreign policy, but it's done in our domestic propaganda as well. You know, our, our mainstream media will celebrate that the stock market is doing so well, uh, like everyone should be dancing in the streets. They will leave out that 80% of all stocks are owned by 10% of the population. And that corporate stock does very well when workers are effectively exploited. So those things are not mentioned when we're supposed to be uh, throwing confetti about the Wall Street returns on investment. Uh, another piece of successful propaganda is, is making sure we just forget our history uh, so that the ruling elite powers that be can repeat it or rewrite it as suits them. Uh, they, they've tried to get us to forget about WMD in Iraq, right? We're supposed to forget that our media did that to us. We're supposed to forget that the intelligence community was an utter disaster for that and lying to us. We're just, just moved past that, trust them implicitly. They want us to forget about McCarthyism now so we can just do it again. Yay! It's the re-up. Um, and, and, but of course, this is, I'm, I'm just mentioning recent historical amnesia. Uh, we also have erased the old, you know, longer ago oppression of people of color, indigenous people. Uh, Margaret, you spoke of memory. Can you speak to the correlation between propaganda and historical amnesia? Yeah, people, uh, uh, there's historical amnesia. It's engineered. Um, Things are disappeared, people are disappeared, or uh, uh, the, the story is changed. I, I, I remember when I was a kid, I was always told how the Soviets would change history, and they took Trotsky out of the history books, and, and I see all these things now when Bernie Sanders has just disappeared from the coverage of all the candidates, and the person who's the most popular is taken out. Um, so um, they will tell us what we should remember, they will, uh, Veterans Day just passed, the veterans are veterans veterans, thank you for their service, you can't criticize them, you can't criticize war, um, you can't talk about how the country really treats veterans. I mean, if you wanted to talk about Veterans Day, why don't you talk about that? The number of homeless veterans, jobless veterans, the fact that these recruiters lie to kids to get them to, uh, to join up. So they will tell you, um, oh, um, uh, recently there was a, uh, the commemoration of the um, uh, how many years? 80th anniversary of the start of World War II. And now the story is that the Soviet Union was as much to blame as Hitler. I mean, this is official, these are official statements from the EU. They have uh, made these statements. So uh, you just lie about the past, you omit. Uh, you lie, you make up, uh, uh, have you noticed this, the Ukraine gate, it's like they've gone down the line completely with the right wing Ukrainian line. You don't say Kiev anymore. They're pronouncing it the way the right wing Ukrainians tell you to say it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, quite, uh, it's quite crazy, but you can't say that you can. That, that I can go around now, suddenly they're like, it's Kiev, it's not Kiev. I was like, when did this happen? <laughs> because the Azov battalion told you to? Um, so yeah, so that's how they do it. Those are some examples of how they do it. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. In the case of Ukraine, it's so crazy that you can't even bring up the fact that Obama rejected sending the weapons that uh, Trump briefly froze. The, the only reason why tr we're even talking about these weapons is because, so Obama was heavily pressured by people like Bill Taylor, who was the Democrats' first star witness, to send th these weapons to Ukraine back in 2014, 2015. Bill Taylor at the time wrote an, a letter to the Washington Post saying that Obama's policy of not sending th th these weapons amounted to appeasement of Russia, sort of using a, a Hitler-esque reference. Uh, now, fast forward five years later, and Bill Taylor is the Democrats' star witness, and we, we can't even talk about the fact that Obama, that it was the official uh, Democratic Party policy and US policy to not send the weapons. The only reason they're being sent is because Trump gets into office. He's now facing th this heavy pressure from the bipartisan foreign policy establishment to do what Obama wouldn't do, 
But this time, he's also being accused of being a Russian puppet and conspirator. So I think that heavily weighed in his consideration uh, to do it. One other thing I want to say on the issue of historic amnesia, and um, it's, it's relevant because we're a progressive gathering, and I, I want to read you something. This is something said this week by a prominent journalist talking about the Iraq War and Iran. He says, the U.S. invasion of Iraq was an historic mistake, a strategic blunder of massive proportions. We invaded and Iran won the war. That is a lesson to be learned today in how we operate in the Middle East and what we do in the Middle East. It, it is such a huge thing to admit to yourself as a country that everything we've done in Iraq for the last 15 years was a mistake. All these lives were lost in vain. All the money poured into there has gone for a misbegotten, tragic mistake that we have benefited what we now consider one of our, one of our biggest enemies, Iran. So who am I quoting there? I'm not quoting Thomas Friedman. I'm not quoting Thomas Friedman in the pages of the New York Times. Uh, I'm not quoting um, I don't know, somebody from the Brookings Inst Institution or the Atlantic Council. I'm quoting James Risen of The Intercept speaking on democracy now. And, you know, the, the context he's speaking in, he's talking about these, these uh, some leaked cables that they, The Intercept has been reporting on, talking about Iran and its role in Iraq. But, you know, this to me just captures the, um, the drift to the right that we're talking about and the, the uh, veneration that's developed for the national security state and its imperatives and how it's warped thinking on the left. And I think, you know, when we talk about historical amnesia, it's really important to, to be concerned about where it's happening close to home. <laughs> Anyone seen the Snowden files around? It's like looking for the Afi Komen on Passover. Like, where, where's, where's the, what happened to the Snowden files? Yeah, that is, that is a, a, a definite question. 90, was it 90 some percent have never been released of the Snowden files? The Snowden files disappear and then the Iran leaks materialize just as the US, Saudi Arabia and Israel are seeking to spin protests in Iraq that, are, that started as anti-corruption protests into anti-Iran protests and the Iran leaks supposedly detail the Iranian takeover of Iraq. Convenient timing. The Intercept doesn't know the source of these leaks. Neither do we. But we do know a veteran Israeli reporter is a co-author of this report, Ronan Bergman, whose last book was blurbed by Ehud Barak and the former director of the Shin Bet, Tamir Pardo. Just suspicious. By the way, and I, uh, I didn't... And he also, he also authored a book uh, that subtitled uh, something about Iran being the world's biggest terrorist power. But anyway, but yeah, I didn't spell out why that, why that comment from Ryzen on democracy and I was so objectionable. And it's obvious, but I just want to spell it out that the reason the Iraq war was horrible is because it destroyed countless lives and destroyed a country and we had no right to do it. And now, and look, and now we have adversarial progressives talking about it in the same way that you would find in the New York Times, that in the same way they talked about the Vietnam War. The outer limit of permissible dissent on the Vietnam War in the mainstream was, oh, it was a mistake, we, it was an error. No, it was a uh, mass, it was a crime against humanity, and we shouldn't lose that again. And by the way, Max mentioned the effort to switch the Iraq protests into anti-Iran protests. Uh, the, two weeks ago, I think it was, New York Times and the Wall Street jo Journal, which is owned by News Corp, uh, did identical cover above the fold stories, um, not identical stories, but identical photo, nearly identical headline saying that Iraq, Iraqi protesters are but, you know, saying, Iran, get out. It's all Iran's fault. And I was like, that's, that's interesting to see the cover of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times be almost identical uh, at the same time. But um, let's see. I, I wanted to ask, and actually that was a perfect segue. Max, I wanted to ask, how does, in the large-scale propaganda, how, does it, how do you feel it ends up happening? Like, I think a lot of people don't believe that an outlet like NPR is told to do negative stories about Venezuela and support a, a coup there that kills, you know, our economic sanctions that kill thousands. So I think people want to know, how is it that 
the large scale propaganda ends up happening uh, in such like lockstep on something like that, something like uh, the chemical weapons, something like Russia Gate. That only happens at RT, Lee. <laughs> Putin hacks your brain, and then you know you start telling yeah, these. Yeah. Uh, you start echoing Kremlin propaganda. That's what. If you're anti-war now, you're echoing Kremlin propaganda. Basically, if you're speaking on forbidden truths, you can be accused of that. Um, so, uh, what happens at NPR? I never worked at NPR. I've noticed that you know NPR has changed dramatically since I used to listen to uh, to it when I was a kid. You know, going on you know vacations with my family. What, what was it? Um, you know, you had all these kind of like drab personalities, and it didn't seem that, um, you know, it, it wasn't that overt. It was liberal, but it wasn't that overt. And now it's like the the, the kind of NPR voice stays the same. You know, this is Ari Shapiro, and we're going to do a special <laughs> on Russia Gate, and then we're going to an eclectic saltwater taffy factory in New England. <laughs> you know, but the the propaganda is just balls to the wall. Uh, NATO propaganda, uh, and I really I call it national propaganda radio. And this is the most insidious aspect of the of the um, in information war is that the trusted outlets that people know and respect, who are uh, a part of the kind of educated liberal middle and upper middle class on the coasts, people who are very influential in their communities, who come out and vote, um, they're the most impacted by this propaganda. So they listen to NPR and they trust what they're hearing about Venezuela uh, being ruled by a dictator who enjoys starving his own people. I mean, I, when Trump turned on the you know, regime change operation in Venezuela by recognizing Juan Guaido, every time I turned on NPR, it seemed like there was a segment about suffering Venezuelans on the Colombian side of the border and they send down these correspondents and you know whether you know, they're um, a bunch of spooks or not, even though they're working for a US public broadcaster, they believe they're American exceptionalists. They believe in the mission of the US exporting democracy abroad. That's just who they are. That's who NPR chooses for the job. And they're also opportunistic and they know that they'll be rewarded for reporting that side of the story and, they, and that angle, that narrative. And they, they don't understand that the rewards come and the rewards are generated through an apparatus of, for example, award ceremonies like the Pulitzer Organization and the Knight Center and all these journalist foundations that are funded by billionaires who substantially act as national security state cutouts who include people like Pierre Omidyar, who is the owner of The Intercept, but who owns a vast media network and owns, you know, he funds the Committee to Protect <laughs> Journalists, which I think has said nothing about the shuttering of Bolivia TV and all of the pro Evo outlets in Bolivia. Um, these are just corporate funded, and you look at who they honor year after year at their ceremonies, and they're honoring journalists who advance the regime change line. So there's an incentive to to, 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 to uh, amplify the narrative and participate in the information war, and there's a disincentive to being us. Um, I, you know, I'm under constant attack in so many ways. Uh, it's, it's very unpleasant. Um, it's, you know, it's great to see all the support, but it's very unpleasant. And I know everyone on this panel has experienced that, and you know, Lee's employer was essentially subjected to a FBI CIA investigation. Uh, and labeled for, they were labeled foreign agents. Um, there aren't that many opportunities for young journalists who are of an anti-imperialist mindset or critical of US foreign policy. Where can they work? Uh, where can they go? I tried to create the gray zone to get a few of my, you know, help, help a few of my friends find a platform. But, uh, thank you, well, we can only, we can only do so much. Uh, we can only do so much, we don't, we don't have, Omidyars uh, to, you know, back us up. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, people know what their bosses want. It's, it's pretty clear that you have to have, first of all, there are fewer in journalism, there's, there are fewer and fewer places to work, fewer and fewer jobs. And now if you don't toe the line, you don't, you don't work. Um, and people know, and they don't have to say it, it's just clear. If you say these things, you can work. If you say something else, you can't work. The people who offer the counter narrative are disappeared, they're unseen. There were people who, who used to be 
Um, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Professor Stephen Cohen. He was always, my whole life, he was like one of the go-to Russia experts on the Sunday morning talk shows. He had op-eds in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Now forget it, He's, he, you don't hear anything. You have to go looking for him to find out what somebody who's knowledgeable about Russia says, but he doesn't say the right thing. Can, can, I, yeah. can, I, just, can I just add one thing before you finish? Uh, the da Daily Beast did an article that got national coverage about how Tulsi Gabbard was being supported by Putin apologists. Like Stephen Cohen. Like donations. And they found three people. One was Stephen Cohen. <laughs> Number two was a correspondent from Redacted Tonight. So a comedian who's on my show donated to Tulsi Gabbard. And this was their proof that all Putin apologists are donating to Tulsi Gabbard. And as this goes on, it gets worse, obviously, because there is a kind of a, a dictatorship. We don't have a free press. We don't have a free press. If you um, are telling the truth, if telling the truth gives you, gets you disappeared, then we don't really have a democracy. We don't really have a free press. And we, we need to just say that. But people know. They won't say it, but they just do it. So this crackpot is always on Joy Reid's show. What is it, that horrible Malcolm man? Nance. Malcolm Nance is on NPR. <laughs> and apparently they let him talk for 15 minutes straight and never even asked him a question. He's went on and on about Trump is a Russian asset. And, you know, and so some guy, and that, what, what does that tell you? Some crackpot from nowhere gets elevated. Now he's making a, a, a small fortune. He gets to be considered a, a credible source. So people know the deal, and they know what to say and what not to say. Yeah, compare Nance to Stephen Cohen. Stephen Cohen is, one of, is the premier Russia scholar of our time who lived in Moscow and produced just path-breaking work about, for example, survivors of the gulags. He was, not, he was, a, he was kind of a liberal about uh, the possibilities of reforming the Soviet Union, of the Soviet Union surviving um, you know, alternative scenarios. He really challenged people to think differently about U.S.-Russia relations. He speaks Russian. He knows the Russian leadership. He knows the people of Russia. Malcolm Nance, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> he doesn't speak Russian. I don't know if he's ever been to Russia. He has no expertise on Russia. He was a um, contractor in the UAE for some time and, worked, and was a, uh, a Navy uh, petty officer. Has, and that's who we hear about Russia. That's who... You know, no offense, but you know, older liberals who are like, you know, just hanging out at home, semi retired, and you just, you know, you're cooking in the kitchen, and you turn on MSNBC, and it just starts to slowly seep into your brain, whatever Malcolm Nance is saying. Yeah. And you turn just crazy. I mean, you just, and these people, and the, these people who I know, and we all know, become impossible to be around. <laughs> I can tell you with I can tell you with Cohen uh, with Stephen Cohen it, yeah, it's he's also faced a lot of marginalization in the, in the left at his own publication the Nation magazine where I also write it's it's a struggle there uh, and you know I benefited from the fact that he's not interviewed a lot of places because I have him now I, I now have him on as much as I can on my show pushback on the gray zone I also have on someone like Ted Postal an eminent uh, Professor Emeritus at MIT, who's been very, done a lot of work on the uh, alleged chemical weapons attack in Duma that we've talked about before that was blamed on the Syrian government, and that allegation led to U.S. airstrikes. Well, Postal's been doing work to, sh to show in his view that, that there was not a chemical weapons attack, and now even with two whistleblowers, still only the, the, the U.S. media outlets to mention it are very few. There's us at the Gray Zone, there's Mint Press News, Sputnik, I'm sure, and RT ha have done it, but pretty much uh, otherwise, it's it's uh, it's it's censored, and it's um, it's extraordinary that even people with with credentials, official credentials, Ted Postal, Stephen Cohen, from these top universities, uh, can't even get interviewed anymore. It's 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 strange. Well, at least uh, CNN has Noam Chomsky on a lot, so <laughs> there's that. Um, I'll just close by saying that uh, I I think. Think about the amount of, of propaganda, of, of the billions of dollars that are spent, the endless airwaves, the endless airtime that is spent trying to convince all of us 
that war is right, that killing, that bombing innocent civilians is fine, that economic sanctions that kill people is fine, that, that, that we shouldn't care about the exploited workers across this country, the, the incredible poverty, the, the amount of effort that goes into that. That all of that is needed to combat the fact that all it takes is uh, one of us to, to, to speak to someone else in a one-on-one -on -one situation and show them that we shouldn't be bombing innocent civilians, that we should care about uh, the poverty in this country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We want to, human beings naturally want to head that way, and instead it takes a massive propaganda arm and operation to get us to do the opposite. So I think the cracks are there in this system, and I think you just got to keep pushing because sometimes when things seem most hopeless is right before everything changes so uh, please please uh, tell everybody where they can find you uh, and also I want to give a round of applause to the Big Apple Coffee Party please let them hear it one more time uh, please say the website one more time uh, Black Agenda Report, tomorrow's Wednesday. Wednesday is Black Agenda Report Day. And uh, Twitter, I'm Freedom Ride Blog. And uh, I'm at thegrayzone.com. Look for the show Pushback, which I host. Uh, I'm on J-Date at, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thegrayzone.com and Moderate Rebels. Moderate, Re moderate, moderate Rebels.com with Ben Norton. Support us on Patreon. And I'm at LeeCamp.com and Redacted Tonight, which you can grab on YouTube or anywhere. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Give it up for uh, Aaron Mate, Martin Kimberly, Mac Lewidow.